the polar pioneers. Imagine a place that's colder than the inside of your freezer. A place so teeth chatteringly chilly that your breath freezes solid in front of your face and your hair turns to icicles. Welcome to the perishing holes. Freezing cold there. The first intrepid explorers to head for the poles had in the foggiest what on earth they were in for. But that did not stop them from going, oh no. Some set off in search of new trade routes. Some hunted seals and whales. Others didn't care about making money. They wanted excitement and adventure. And they got it in bucket loads. Mind you, if you didn't mind icing with death, being a polar pioneer was the kind of explorer to be. If you didn't freeze to death, you'd be treated like a superstar. Besides, if you look at any map of the perishing poles, you'll see it's packed full of explorers' names. Having a sea or an ice sheet or even a seal named after you was one of the perks of the job. Name, shame our next polar pioneer never got to see his name on the map. Fearless Franklin. In the 19th century, bold British sailor Sir John Franklin became a household name. But it wasn't for his intrepid exploring. Nope. Unfortunately, Fearless Franklin was dead famous for getting lost. For centuries, intrepid explorers from Europe had been searching for a new trade route to the east. Trouble is, the way they picked lay right across the frozen far north of North America and through the iceberg-infested Arctic Ocean. It was always called the Northwest Passage, and it was proving horribly hard to find. Now here's an earth-shattering fact for you. British explorer Sir Martin Frobisher didn't suffer fools gladly. He was tough, brave, and rugged. All the things an explorer should be. In 1576, Feisty Frobisher set sail in search of the Northwest Passage. He didn't find it, but on icy Baffin Island, he spotted a sparkling lump of rock. Frobisher was sure it was gold. Over the next two years, he made two more voyages and collected tons of the stuff. He was going to be filthy rich. Yippee! It must be worth a fortune. Or was it? Unfortunately for Frobisher, it turned out not to be gold at all. It was just worthless iron pirate. That's a mixture of iron and sulfur. Some people call it fool's gold. It certainly fooled poor old Frobisher. So today we're looking at Sir John Franklin from the UK, British. At the tender young age of 14, John left home and ran away to sea. He sailed to Australia, the Arctic three times, and North America. You name it, he went there. By the time Franklin was 59 years old, he was looking forward to a well-earned rest. Instead, he was picked to lead a daring new expedition to find the Northwest Passage. Despite his age, Franklin was perfect for the job. He was brave and kind and got on brilliantly with everyone. Besides, he was used to being in the thick of danger, and frankly, it was just as well. In the Arctic, things aren't always what they seem, as foolish Frobisher found out. In 1818, British sailor John Ross became the latest explorer to try to find the Fable Passage. On the latest, and the latest to fail miserably. He did discover a range of mountains, which he named the Crocker Mountains after a Royal, Royal Navy Admiral. But when another expedition tried to find them the following year, the mysterious mountains were nowhere to be seen. Ross had been seeing things. 
For the rest of his life, his nickname was, guess what? Yep, Croker Mountains. Cruel. In May 1845, Franklin set sail from England with two sturdy ships, Erebus and Terra, and a 130 men crew. The ships were fitted with all of the latest modcons. They even had central heating to keep the crew toasty warm. And they had a ship's monkey instead of a ship's cat. Franklin's plan was to head north to Greenland, then west across the north of North America, and through a murderous maze of icy islands and channels. So that was what he had planned to do and where he had planned to go. By July, Franklin had reached Greenland and wrote a cheery letter home. So far, so good. Two weeks later, a whaling ship spotted the ships moored to an iceberg to stop them drifting off. The curious captain went on board and had dinner with Sir Jolly Sir John, but I'm afraid this tale is a horribly sad ending. For fearless Franklin was never seen again. Back home, no news was good news at first. But as the years passed and there was still no word from Franklin, his friends began to fear the worst. Search party after search party was sent out and the rescuers tried everything to contact the missing men, including catching a load of foxes and trying notes, tying notes to their collars. But that would have foxed, bet that would have foxed Franklin. But it didn't do any good. Missing Franklin's whereabouts were still a mystery. Meanwhile, Franklin's wife, Lady Jane, refused to give up her hobby for lost. She even consulted a fortune teller, but there was no sign of Franklin in her crystal ball. So Lady Jane organized her own search party. It set off in 1857, led by salty old sea dog, Captain Francis McClintock. If anyone could find Franklin, the doughty captain could especially as Lady Jane was offering a reward of £20,000 for news, a small fortune for the, ta for the time. There is his missing poster. The search lasted for over a year, but in February 1859, Lady Jane, Jane got the news she had been dreading. The search party had found a message written 12 years before by two of Franklin's most trusted men. It was buried under a pile of stone on King William Island. And it gave vital clues about Franklin's tragic fate. It started like this. HMS Erebus and HMS Terra, 1847 to 1848. Whoever finds this paper is requested to forward it to the Secretary of the Admiralty, London, with a note of the time and place at which it was found. Or, if more convenient, to deliver it for that purpose to the British Consul, at the nearest port. The note went on. In summer 1846, the ships were making steady progress and had the pass passage in their sights. Then it all went horribly wrong. How? Well, Franklin took a wrong turning. Simple as that. It wasn't really Franklin's fault. The maps he was using got modeled. But it meant the ship sailed straight into the worst of the pack ice. Pack ice isn't anything to do with suitcases or going on your holidays. Horrible geographers will tell you that in winter in the Arctic Ocean, the, the Arctic Ocean freezes solid. Pack ice is broken bits of sea ice that drift on the wind and ocean currents. It's horribly hazardous to ships, as poor old Franklin found out. By September, they were stuck fast off King William Island. Franklin died the following June. Ten months later, the rest of the crew abandoned ship. Starving and scurvy ridden, they headed south, hoping to reach the mainland. Sadly, they never made it. One by one, they died. Next to their skeletons, the search party found the gruesome leftovers of their last meal. It seemed that when the men's meager rations ran out, they'd been forced to eat each other.
The first person to sail through the Northwest Passage was ace Norwegian explorer Roald Advinson in, in 1906. Thanks to his trusty boat, the Gjoa, which was small and nifty for nipping in and out of the ice floes. Even then, it took him three years. Guess who Admetson dedicated his success to? None other than good old Franklin, his boyhood hero. By the way, Admetson became one of the greatest explorers ever. Catch up with him again later on in this book. That's where he went. Roald Admonson. But finding the Northwest Passage was only the tip of the iceberg. There was still the perishing North Pole to be conquered, and that is just where we're off to now.